oil spills, chemical gas releases, medical errors, crashes, accidents happen. And when they do, a natural question to ask is, what missteps and miscalculations were made? But I want to ask a different question. I want to ask, what can go wrong when there are no miscalculations? I want to understand rational accidents. Let me begin with the description of an accident at a Union Carbide chemical plant in West Virginia. This description is taken from a book by Charles Perrault. Alder carb oxime gas is transferred to a standby tank. It's a dangerous gas. The tank has a heating blanket which is set to come on, but the operators don't know that. The operators don't check the temperature gauges because they think there's no need. A couple of warning systems fail to activate. The tank blows, the gas is released. There's a gas detection system, but it's not programmed for this gas. A few other failures take place. A lot goes wrong to cause this action. I want to focus on one thing in particular. The operators do not examine the temperature gauges. Why not? They think there's no need, but still, it's a pretty elementary safety precaution. Why don't they carry it out? Before answering that, let's look at a different kind of accident, surgical confusions. A surgical confusion is when I'm supposed to operate on the left leg, but I operate on the right leg instead. Or it's the wrong procedure. Or it's the right procedure, but the wrong patient. <laughs> Rest assured, these don't happen very often, but they do happen. Here's an example from a paper by John Simon. The patient, his wife, and the operating room schedule all indicate that the left eye is to be operated on. The surgical fellow confirms that it's the left eye, but he hasn't checked the surgeon's notes. The block is up, uh, put onto the left eye. Guess what? It's the right eye. How can errors like this and medical errors in general be prevented? One recent suggestion that's had quite a bit of success is the use of checklists. This is a checklist endorsed by the World Health Organization. A lot of things going on in this checklist. The part that interests us here today is the part cons uh, intended to ensure that the correct site is being operated on. At the beginning of the operation, the site is listed on the surgical chart. The patient is then asked to confirm it, the nurse is asked, the anesthesia professional is asked, and the surgeon is asked. Five checks that it's the right site. I've seen checklists with six, seven, eight redundant checks. Some doctors love this kind of thing, patients too. Some doctors think it's a big waste of time. Is it a waste of time? How much safer is six checks than three checks? Twice as safe? In order to answer that, we're going to have to do a little bit of math. I'm the surgeon. Say that when I'm looking over the paperwork, there's a 1 in 20 chance I make a mistake. So I ask the nurse to confirm. The nurse also has a 1 in 20 chance of making a mistake, but we're okay so long as one of us catches it. That is to say there's going to be an accident only if we're both wrong. And the chance of that happening is 1 in 20 times 1 in 20 equals 1 in 400. And with three independent checks, the chance of an accident is 1 in 20 times 1 in 20 times 1 in 20 equals 1 in 8,000. And with six independent checks, the chance is 1 in 20 multiplied six times equals 1 in 64 million. Wow. A little math is a beautiful thing. Six checks isn't twice as safe as three checks. It's reduced the chance of an accident from 1 in 8,000 to 1 in 64 million. It's not a waste of time at all. And that exponential gain from redundancy underlies the safety of many systems. A nuclear power plant isn't going to have a meltdown because someone flips the wrong switch. A lot of things have to go wrong, and a lot of things going wrong is very unlikely. And from that point of view, the more redundancies, the more checks, the better. Except that there's a catch. For the math to be correct, the probabilities of accidents have to be independent of each other. And that pesky independence condition can mess things up in a lot of ways. Let's see what can go wrong in this particular example. I'm the surgeon. I have a 1 in 20 chance of making a mistake when I'm looking over the paperwork. But of course, the chance I make a mistake depends on how much attention I'm paying, how hard I'm concentrating. Suppose that if I'm only paying partial attention, I have a 1 in 4 chance. Why would I only pay partial attention? 
I have a lot of things I need to think about in the operating room. I have only so much mental energy. I have to decide where I should concentrate that energy, even if I'm only deciding at a subconscious level. Let's compare three checks and six checks again. The nurse says left eye. Surgical fellow says left eye. They're both concentrating fully. If I concentrate fully too, we saw the chance of an accident is 1 in 8,000. If I concentrate partially, the chance of an accident is 1 in 20, 1 in 20, 1 in 4, 1 in 1,600. Is that a big change? What should I do? Numbers are useful, but only if they're presented in a useful way. Let me make this a bit more useful. Say that I do 400 operations a year. For a cataract surgeon, that's quite a realistic number. If I concentrate fully, there'll be one accident every 20 years. If I concentrate partially, there'll be one accident every four years. Should I concentrate fully? Yeah. <laughs> Operating on the wrong eye, one every four years, is a pretty crappy safety record. On top of that, newspapers just love to report that. Everyone should concentrate fully. There's one accident every four year, 20 years. Five checks. Five people are concentrating fully. What should I do? Fully, partially. Run the math again. If I concentrate fully, there's one accident every 160,000 years. If I concentrate partially, there's one accident every 32,000 years. Luck. Once every 32,000 years is never. My practice isn't going to be around nearly that long. I should really concentrate partially and save my mental energy for a different aspect of the operation. So far, so good. Problem arises when everybody thinks that way. Everyone concentrates partially. Everyone has a one in four chance of making a mistake. And we end up with one accident every 10 years. The extra checks have backfired. Six, three checks, everyone concentrates fully. One accident every 20 years. Six checks, one accident every 10 years. Making the system safer has made it more dangerous. But let's think about this logic a little bit more carefully. I think everyone's concentrating fully, so I don't need to. Everyone thinks that way, so no one concentrates fully. But shouldn't I realize everyone's thinking that way? No one's concentrating fully, so I better concentrate fully after all. Everyone realizes that, so everyone pays attention after all. But then no one needs to pay attention. But then everyone needs to. But then no one needs to. But then, oh, boy, where does that leave us? How can I even think about this problem? Well, there's a whole field of study devoted to thinking about exactly that kind of problem. And that field is called game theory. And if I write down this problem very carefully, not just for the specific numbers I have here, and I do a game theoretic analysis, what I'm going to discover is very generally, the more checks, the less care each person takes. More checks, good. Less care, bad. System getting safer or less safe. Could go either way. Depends on the specific problem I'm looking at. But three things will always be true. The system is never as safe as it seems. It's not just a question of more checks, the better. You have to think about the number of checks carefully. And if there is an accident and it's investigated, don't be surprised when you hear the well-worn phrase, it was an accident waiting to happen. There were lots of safety protocols which weren't being followed. The operators didn't check the temperature gauges. The surgical fellow didn't check the surgeon's notes. And you have to anticipate that. Let me emphasize, the problem here is not that we have slackers or loafers or the wrong culture or people are poorly motivated. On the contrary, these people are trying to do the right thing. They're trying to put their efforts where it's needed. The operators don't check the temperature gauges because there are seven other safety checks anyway. And they have a lot of things they need to do. The safety features are self-limiting by their very nature. And that needs to be taken into account. If you're a parent, you might discover that sometimes when everyone's keeping an eye on your child, nobody is. Let me look at a different kind of problem. In order to do this, we're going to look at uh, the crash of an Air Florida flight in 1982. Here's a transcript from the cockpit recording. Okay. Captain, okay your throttles. Holler if you need the wipers. It's spooled. Real cold, real cold. Co-pilot, 
God, look at that thing. That doesn't seem right, does it? Oh, uh, that's not right. Captain, yes it is. There's 80. Co-pilot, no, I don't think that's right. Uh, maybe it is. Captain, 120. Co-pilot, I don't know. Captain, V1, easy V2. Plane takes off. Unfortunately, the co-pilot is right. The plane crashes. If you're not a pilot, you don't really understand what they're talking about here. But one thing is clear. The co-pilot has his doubts and the captain ignores him. Very autocratic culture in the cockpit. Captain's the big boss who doesn't really need to listen to anybody else. An aviation expert said that has to change. A few years ago, there was an incident where two planes had inadvertently been cleared for takeoff at the same time. Co-pilot notices out of the corner of his eyes, puts, pushes down the yoke of the plane, stops his plane from taking off. The other plane takes off safely. And the pilot says, that's fantastic. That would never have happened in the bad old autocratic days. Hospitals have learned the same nature. Traditionally, the same lesson. Traditionally, the operating room is very autocratic too. The surgeon is the king or queen, doesn't really need to listen to anybody else. And hospitals say, no, everyone needs to be empowered to speak. If the nurse spots a problem, we need to listen to the nurse. Some boardrooms are saying the same thing. Everyone has to be encouraged to speak. If someone spots a problem, say a potential rogue trader, they should be able to speak up. That's great, fantastic. But is it really that straightforward? Suppose the co-pilot had stopped the plane from taking off, but the other plane had just been taxiing harmlessly. What would the pilot have said? Vigilance first, safety first, don't worry about it, very good. Maybe. But what if the co-pilot does it again and again? At what point does the captain say, get rid of that co-pilot? Let's look at some numbers. I'm the nurse. We're about to operate on the left leg. I look over the paperwork. I say, Ooh, wait a second, something's a little bit ambiguous here. I think maybe it's the right leg. There's a small chance, 1% chance. Should I speak up? When I ask people this question, they invariably say yes. A 1% chance of operating on the wrong leg is a pretty big chance. A 1% chance something's wrong with your plane is a huge chance. I speak up, wait, 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 I think it might be the wrong leg. Turns out it's the correct leg, I'm the one who's wrong. A month later, I notice something else with a 1% chance. Wait, 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 I'm the one who's wrong. Two weeks later, wait, 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 I'm the one who's wrong. How many times can I be wrong before you fire me? When I ask people this question, they usually say three or four times. I'm going to be more generous. I'm going to say eight times. I can be wrong eight times in a row before I'm fired. Here's a little chart. In the first line I've written, I should speak up if I spot a 1% chance. In the second line I've written down, I can be wrong eight times in a row before I'm fired. And the third line is a little calculation. If I speak up every time there's a 1% chance, what's the chance I will be wrong eight times in a row and fired? 92%. You've told me, please speak up, please speak up, thank you very much, you're fired. <laughs> the incentives are contradicting themselves, and that's also a game theoretic problem. There's a difficulty here which is not easy to resolve. You might think, let's just have a policy no one is ever fired for speaking up. But then you risk having a situation where you have incompetence speaking up for no reason, and you can't get rid of them. I've highlighted two issues here today, and there are more. There's a real problem. My colleague Juan Duber and I have called this the problem of prevention, and I don't know that it can be completely overcome. It can be alleviated, and a well-designed checklist can certainly help but it's important that the issues first be recognized for what they are. And we've taken a step in that direction here today. Thank you.